This is episode 160 of That Shakespeare Life. My name is Cassidy Cash. This is the episode where we dive into the real life and history of William Shakespeare. If you like going behind the curtain and exploring the food, people, games, scandals, clothing, and so much more from the life of William Shakespeare, then this is the place to be every Monday. So go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button because we're here every week. In 1588, one man named Tom Bright introduced a innovative new method for quickly writing down what you hear during a live performance. He published a manual called Charactery, and it was a term of Bright's own invention. Charactery is the first English version of an ancient method of shorthand dating back to the time of Cicero, and it allowed you to pirate anyone's live performance, provided you had enough patience to learn the complicated system of charactery. Bright's innovative new technology applied a complicated array of symbols and characters that, while intimidating to review today, was a huge hit in Elizabethan England, with several additional shorthand methods being published in England within just a few years of Bright's work. Walking the line between illegal behavior and artistic prowess, masters of shorthand in the late 16th century are responsible for many of the surviving copies of sermons from Shakespeare's lifetime, and our guest this week argues in his publication, Shakespeare, Playfair, and the Pirates, that shorthand may be behind the many errors we find in Shakespeare's bad quartos, as well as responsible for the reason we even have copies of Shakespeare's plays today. The obvious question when you realize that audience members at the Globe Theater were writing down the play as they heard it was to wonder, how did they accomplish this task? Were they using quill pinks and inkwells? And did they get arrested for pirating the works of the greatest playwrights in the age? Here this week to explain all of these questions, including mechanics of stealing words from the air as they're being spoken, uh, along with what kind of impact these pirates had on the theater culture of the 16th century is our guest, Brian Crockett. Brian Crockett is an emeritus English professor at Loyola University, Maryland. He has written numerous books and articles, many of them about Shakespeare and his surroundings. In addition to a career's worth of teaching courses in English Renaissance literature, Crockett has developed subspecialties in the religious discourse of Shakespeare's day, as well as the newly developed technology of shorthand transcription of live performances. Crockett has delivered lectures in the US, Canada, and the UK, including one at London's Globe Theater. He is also an ex-actor, dramaturg, and novelist. His 2015 novel about John Dunn called Love's Alchemy was a finalist for the Historical Novel Society's Annual Achievement Award as well as for the Tuscany Prize. Married and with three grown children and a grandchild on the way, he lives in Baltimore with his wife and artist Pamela Crockett. Hello, Brian. Welcome to the show. Hi, Cassidy. It's good to be here. In Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor, Shakespeare uses the word charactery to describe a fairy language. In Act 5, Scene 5, Hostess Quickly says, quote, fairies use flowers for their charactery, end quote. Brian, using flowers for charactery sounds a lot like pictures instead of words. Was charactery a system based on pictures similar to what we think of as hieroglyphics? Well, pictorially based written languages like ancient Sumerian or Egyptian or Chinese have the advantage of being intuitive when you learn to read and write. So if uh, the character for the word house looks like a house, then when you're learning, you, you have a kind of running start. So a, a smart four-year-old can figure out that if a little design on paper that looks like a house, it must mean house. But those languages in pictographs aren't designed primarily for speed. Timothy Bright's system, though, was designed for speed. And he used little marks that you could jot down quickly uh, if it was a common word. And he would just add another little mark if it was a, a less common but related word. So just before Shakespeare started writing his plays, uh, we know from quotes like the one you just gave us that he'd uh, heard of the system and he used that word character twice. Um, you quoted Hostess Quickly's line in the Merry Wives of Windsor. 
Hostess Quickly is a wonderful character. She's that uh, quick-witted, good-hearted, uh, but slightly dim, who puts up with the wonderful quick-witted character, Falstaff, in the Henry IV and V plays and Merry Wives of Windsor. And it's interesting that Hostess Quickly uses that word character in a positive sense. In that scene, she's sort of implausibly dressed up as the fairy queen, even though she's no Titania. She's saying that fairies don't need the alphabet or pen and ink to write things down. They express themselves with flowers. And that's a, it's a touching idea, natural rather than uh, man-made technology as a means of communication. But what's interesting is that there's no hint of animosity between Shakespeare and the practitioners of character. Uh, whether he knew that these guys were ripping off his plays, we just don't know. Brian, when we think of Shakespeare writing anything or anyone from his lifetime writing something down, most of us have this mental picture of a quill pen. And when these pirates of spoken performance wanted to take down a story using character, which you mentioned is done with great speed, they're in a venue like the Globe, where most people are standing there in the Groundlings area. And I just wonder practically, how would they be juggling an inkwell and a quill pen to, to quickly write this down? Where is that the method they were using to take these notes or were they using something else? Well, we think they were using something else. Someone really adept at using uh, quill and ink can write very quickly, but you're right. It'd be hard to be standing with an inkwell and a quill and, a, and paper in the audience with other groundlings milling around and jostling. So it's likely that someone transcribing words in character would be seated in the theater. And those more expensive seats were not just for nobility, but anybody who could afford to pay for them. The other part of your question is about alternatives to quill and ink. It's true that the surviving manuscripts we have of plays from the period used ink uh, that was then typeset for quick but less permanent writing, there were pencils. Graphite had been discovered in the Lake District of England right about the time Shakespeare was born. Uh, you'd need to keep your pencil fairly sharp for taking notes in character, but that could be done really quickly. A single swipe on a sharpening stone would work. So the tools for that existed. Was copying down sermons or theater performances through shorthand and then selling copies of it considered illegal behavior during Shakespeare's lifetime or was the use of this new technology seen as a valuable skill? Well, it's clear that note taking, especially in churches was considered a legitimate, valuable skill. Uh, taking notes of a sermon was encouraged. It was a pious activity to sit in the congregation and jot down what the preacher said. Usually, of course, uh, notes were more or less in outline form rather than full transcriptions. The evidence we have of whole sermons transcribed from the audience tells us that preachers were generally happy to see their words promulgated, most of them anyway. Some preachers, especially the really artful ones, got angry when they saw their hastily transcribed versions of their sermons coming into print and were being bought and sold. So one minister and theologian named Thomas Playfair, for example, uh, a preacher contemporary with Shakespeare, had nothing but contempt for uh, transcribers who misquoted him. And that happened twice. Booksellers were making money selling unauthorized versions of his sermon uh, and Playfair figures pretty largely in my work on shorthand in his authorized public version of a sermon called The Mean in Mourning, for example. And that sermon is a, a virtuoso performance. Parts of it are worthy of Shakespeare. He has this to say in the letter to the reader in the introduction. I had rather have had my head broken than my sermon so mangled. For this sermon hath been twice printed 
already without my procurement or privity any manner of way, yea, to my very great grief and trouble. So he could fume and find a bookseller to print the authorized version, but that was about all he could do. It'd be over a hundred years before uh, copyright laws like the ones we have began to appear. Brian writes that there are several successful shorthand techniques proliferating around London during Shakespeare's lifetime, including one method by Peter Bales in 1590 called brachigraphy, and another in 1602 by John Willis called stenography. Brian, how were these methods different from Bright's original character method of shorthand? Well, Peter Bales's brachigraphy was a partly plagiarized uh, version of character with a more user-friendly appearance. Uh, for charactery, Timothy Bright used little markings that you could jot down really quickly, but they were unfamiliar looking. So for his system, Peter Bales used letters of the alphabet with little marks added to them. So brachigraphy was a bit more cumbersome than charactery, but people who were experts at both systems uh, could churn out pretty good transcriptions. And John Willis's stenography, which came out in 1602, uh, more than a decade after Bright's and Bales's systems, was a real improvement. Of course, we still use the word stenography in court trials. Uh, we still have court stenographers. That method was uh, the first phonetically based system of shorthand. So instead of arbitrarily matching each little mark to a different word or phrase, you made a mark that represented a, a certain sound. It doesn't seem likely though that uh, character, or that, I'm sorry, that stenography was used to transcribe any of Shakespeare's plays. Despite the three shorthand practitioners Brian cites in his work as being successful at their shorthand creation, the method itself, when put to use for copying down sermons, was, as Playfair lets us know, received with this great contempt. Another preacher who fell victim to shorthand transcription was Anthony Tyrell, who in 1589 writes, quote, my words were no sooner out of my mouth, but a young youth had penned my sermon verbatim by charactery, an art newly invented. It was this youth's pleasure for the manifesting of his skill in that swift kind of writing to publish my sermon in print, end quote. Brian, I take notes here while we're talking on the show, and I consider myself pretty quick at typing, but even I am unable to transcribe the entire conversation verbatim. What kind of speed and accuracy is being displayed here for the preacher to assert that a youth copied his words down verbatim? Is it really practical or even possible to capture an entire verbal performance from the audience using shorthand? Well, uh, some preachers uh, hated it when their sermons were pirated in, in shorthand and then uh, sold to printers uh, because there were big mistakes in a lot of them, but not all. In that letter to the reader in the published version of that sermon, Tyrell says that the young man took down the sermon absolutely verbatim. So the short answer to your question is yes, it was possible. And here's why. Remember that while literacy was on the rise in Shakespeare's day, it was still a predominantly oral culture, not a literary one. And so people's memories were generally more highly developed than ours. Centuries old habits of thought made memorization of a lot of information easier back then than it is for most of us now. So if a person had that well developed kind of memory and then learn to read, that person could memorize huge swaths of writing. Think of an actor like Richard Burbage, the luckiest actor in history, because he got to play, uh, he got to be the first to play Hamlet and Macbeth and King Lear and Prospero and all the others. Uh, but Burbage would have to keep in his head hefty parts like the ones I just mentioned and hefty parts of 25 or 30 more plays ready to be performed on short notice. If the king or the queen or some other nobleman or his boss, Philip Henslow, uh, 
requested it. And one thing that makes Shakespeare so astoundingly rich is that he had a mind that was fully immersed in that age old oral culture and the newer written culture. He could draw on a vast memory and then give what he remembered that impressively artful literary expression that we all love. Brian's work cites the research of H.T. Price from the 1920s, who analyzed pirated versions of Elizabethan sermons in order to put empirical data behind the question of accuracy concerning Elizabethan shorthand. What Price discovered is that aside from only a dozen or so wrong pronouns, tenses, and plurals across thousands of lines of text, the shorthand versions were predominantly accurate, as Tyrell tells us. Price applies his data to the analysis of Shakespeare's so-called bad quartos, concluding Including that it must have been possible for charactery to be behind the copies we have today of Shakespeare's quarto plays that feature some of these odd variances. Brian, explain for the uninitiated what the bad quarto is for Shakespeare's works. Then tell us, why are they called bad? Is it because these plays were pirated by Elizabethan charactery artists? Well, uh, the term bad quarto is unfortunate. The reference is to plays that were published individually. They tended to be in quarto format, which just means that the, the big sheet of printer's paper was folded twice and then cut into four pages, hence quarto. And then each of those four pages was printed on the front and the back. So quarto is just the name of a format. About half of Shakespeare's plays were first printed in that format individually uh, so they just happen to be quartos. Now, some of those quartos are of really good literary quality, but a few of them have problems. In some cases, better editions of those same plays, quartos with fewer mistakes and garbled passages were published subsequently. Take Hamlet, for example. The first quarto came out in 1603 and it's full of passages that just don't make sense. A second quarto came out two years later, and it's miles better than the first one. And yet a third quarto, or I'm sorry, a third version is included in the, the first folio, the big collected works edition of 1623, seven years after Shakespeare died. Now of the plays that were first published as quartos, about a half dozen, have various sorts of problems. And each of these plays set of problems is unique to it. So it's unfortunate that about a hundred years ago, a few of these texts were lumped together as bad quartos. And there was speculation that maybe some of them were first written down by someone in the audience taking notes in character. Then about 75 years ago, a group of scholars who called themselves the new bibliographers developed a theory of what they called memorial reconstruction. The idea was that these bad quartos came from rogue actors in Shakespeare's troupe who tried to make a little money on the side by writing down what they remembered from the plays and selling the result to a publisher. But to make the case that those plays were memorially reconstructed, the, the new bibliographers had to debunk the theory of shorthand transcription. Uh, not until fairly recently have some of us looked really closely at that debunking. And we've debunked the debunkers. We're back to shorthand as the best theory for why a few of Shakespeare's plays are the way they are. But we're looking at that question now in new ways. The bad quarto version of Shakespeare's Hamlet from 1603 that you mentioned is housed at the British Library and available online. And I will link you to the show notes for where to read that in today's episode. It shows stage directions, entrances, and exits included in the text. Brian, in a society where theater was considered something to be heard as opposed to something to be seen the way we perceive theater today, why would charactery also have cataloged the stage directions? I wouldn't be too insistent about uh, hearing a play versus seeing one. Both terms were used in, in Shakespeare's day. Uh, 
But the first function of stage directions was, of course, to help actors know what to do. But after a play was published, those same stage directions help the reader to picture what's going on. And that's why shorthand transcribers would use stage directions. Uh, that was sort of the norm for printed plays, but a literary pirate could make better money if the printed version looked like the real thing. So there are technical ways of identifying stage directions that are more likely to have been written by an eyewitness, a literary pirate in the audience, uh, than by the author of the play. In Love's Labor's Lost, Holofenes goes into a beautiful rant oh, about yeah. words and variances, which taken in context of what we know about the fluid nature of spelling in Elizabethan England, as well as what we're learning today about character and stenography, it sounds as if the presence of character artists in the audience was an anticipated reality for players in the theater. In Act 5, Scene 1, Holofenes says, quote, he draweth out the thread of his verbosity finer than the staple of his argument. I abhor such fanatical phantasmas, such as insociable and point devised companions such rigors of orthography as to speak doubt fine when he should say doubt debt when he should pronounce debt d-e-b-t not d-e-t he clepeth a calf calf half half neighbor vocateur neighbor nay abbreviated nay this is abominable end quote the actual text of the play spells out these words for comedic effect, showing that there is a difference in spelling for calf and calf. But this isn't, this is surprising because there wasn't a consistent and agreed upon system of spelling for the English words. This was far from linguistically established at this point in history. And when written down in text, these lines are hilarious because you can see the spelling differences. However, Brian, I wonder what it would have been like for a stenographer or character artist to try and transcribe this scene down to paper during a live performance. Is Shakespeare writing these lines to intentionally mess with the people he knows are in the audience trying to copy this down based on sound? That's a wonderful passage. Lots of actors uh, playing Holofernes, or could be. It's sort of satisfying to think so, that Shakespeare's messing with the pirates. Uh, I'm not sure there's clear evidence of that, but maybe so. It, it seems in character for Shakespeare, right? Uh, the man did have an amazing sense of humor. Arguably, Shakespeare's plays were never meant to be written down in a published book format at all. As performance pieces, any bound version of the full script was done after the fact, which begs the question for you, Brian, are there any truly authorized versions of Shakespeare's plays that we mm. can say the Bard actually compiled himself? Or are the longhand manuscripts of his plays just pirated shorthand versions? Well, if there were those sorts of pirated longhand manuscripts. We haven't yet found them, and uh, I doubt that we're ever likely to. They no doubt existed, but there's a reason that they weren't preserved. A literary pirate could use shorthand to transcribe the live performance and then use those shorthand notes to write out a longhand version that would serve as the copy that the bookseller would buy. And a typesetter who worked for the bookseller would use that longhand version to set the type in the printing press. After the books were printed, there'd be no need to keep uh, the longhand versions uh, because people would have the book as it came off the printing press. So I think you're right that Shakespeare doesn't seem to have thought of his plays as literature the handwritten scripts were what the acting troupe needed to stage a good performance, not literature to last through the ages. He was a man of the theater through and through. And when it came to the plays, our best guess is that the performance was everything to Shakespeare. If he expected or at least hoped that some of his work would survive as literature, it was probably his long narrative poems like Venus and Adonis or The Rape of Lucrece. What I was trying to ask with that question is when we have like the 1603 quarto version of, of Hamlet or these other 
quarto versions, any any versions of Shakespeare's plays that aren't based on the first folio, are those quarto versions, do we have them at all because someone copied them down using shorthand? Because yeah. it wasn't Shakespeare that wrote them that way. Right. The prompter for uh, the acting troupe could have sold uh, the handwritten manuscript to a printer. Could have happened that way. It could be that a couple of those actors tried to remember the play and wrote down what they could remember and sold that to the printer. Um, with the first quarto of Hamlet, I don't think it's likely that uh, the transcriber was somebody in the audience taking it down in shorthand. But you can make that case uh, for a few of the plays. Um, in an article in Shakespeare Quarterly, I've made that case for the first so-called bad quarto of Romeo and Juliet. But I don't think it would work for all the, the quartos, the bad quartos. Does that answer your question? It does. And we'll link to the article in Shakespeare Quarterly that Brian writes. Oh, so good. you can check out for yourself his evidence for the bad quarto version of Romeo and Juliet being a product of shorthand. Brian, this is really exciting stuff to think about this new innovative technology coming to be right as, you know, Shakespeare's writing some of these plays and, and the role of shorthand in preserving Shakespeare's works for us today. What are some of your favorite books or resources you can recommend we use when we want to ah. explore this further? Well, uh, the scholar who's published some of the most interesting work uh, on the topic is named Adele Davidson. Uh, she has a book called Shakespeare in Shorthand. It's mostly about the textual history of King Lear. She and I disagree about quite a number of things, but that's a good place to start. She's done some very good work. And there's a scholar named Lori McGuire who has a great book uh, called Shakespearean Suspect Texts. Um, and one more, Lucas Earn, E-R-N-E, -E, uh, has a really thought-provoking book called Shakespeare as Literary Dramatist. Um, in that book, he's rethinking what we were just talking about. Uh, he takes a skeptical look at the idea that Shakespeare didn't think of his plays as literature. Uh, Ern makes uh, the case that Shakespeare did write his plays with a readership in mind. So it's good to get both sides of this sort of thing. I've, I've given you some references uh, for people who would disagree with me, but that's the way scholarship works. Those are all very Absolutely. good scholars. And it's fun to look at all the sides. We'll make sure to link to these books as well as to Brian's work in the show notes for today's episode. So stay tuned after the conversation to find the link Great. for those. Brian, we ask everyone this next question here at That Shakespeare Life, and that's what's the one book you would take with you on a deserted mm -hmm. island? My friends in England tell me I'm supposed to allow you the complete works of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible. So your choice would be in addition to those. Uh, the hardest question. <laughs> um, I'm glad that your friends allowed you to give me the complete works of Shakespeare and the Bible. Uh, I wonder which, which one would be more dog-eared and worn out after a few years, but, but thanks for that. Um, the, the Iliad comes to mind uh, as a strong contender, or just for modern day smart amiable companionship. I'd probably consider David Foster Wallace's infinite jest. But in the end, I think I'd find the, the most lasting, profound pleasure in John Milton's Paradise Lost. As a poet, Milton is one of the very few in Shakespeare's league. So that's what I'd take, Paradise Lost. I think that's an excellent selection. You'd be well set up on that deserted island with, with Shakespeare, the Bible, and Milton. You, you'd be well set up for a while. So what's next for you? What are you working on now that you're excited about? Well, uh, I'm recently retired from academic life. So as an emeritus professor at Loyola University, of Maryland, I can teach a course now and then if I want to. But so far, I've taken a break from teaching. And lately, I've taken up playwriting. 
And of course, it's, uh, it's intimidating to, to do that when you've spent your life with Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've, I've, I've found the answer. I've figured out what to do with him. Oh, I've, tell us the secret. Yeah, I put him in one of my plays as a character. Oh, there and you go. So he has to say what I say, he <laughs> says. And I've written another play that's um, set in the near future and is a, a dystopian uh, political black mirror-ish uh, play that uh, is about technology gone wrong in politics in a senatorial race. So projects like that are enough to keep me busy for now. That's fascinating. I'll look forward to it as theaters are opening back up slowly, but surely these days, I'll look forward to seeing that one performed and staying in touch so we can find out all of the ways that you put Shakespeare back on the stage. Thank you so much, Brian Croggett, for being here today and taking us through the history of shorthand. This was a really fun conversation. Well, thank you, Cassidy, for the invitation. It's been great. Find links to the resources Brian mentions in today's episode, along with a free sample of how you can try out Charactery for yourself in the free download that's available in the show notes for today's episode. Visit the link below this video to find out more. That's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash. Thank you for being here. I hope you learned something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.